afternoon, everyone. It's mo- good morning. Good morning, good morning. Before we get into this presentation, I know we just prayed, but I love to pray. And I really, really do encourage everyone to just avail yourself. These are the last few meetings that we're going to have. I believe the camp ends at 3 o'clock. I don't believe that we can pray too much. Amen? And so I just want to invite you just to take another opportunity with me right now to pray. Just take the next 60 seconds. I thank you for praying for me, but I'm asking you now to pray for yourselves. Amen? Pray for the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to work upon your minds. And when you hear my voice, I'll be closing us in prayer. So if we could just take another few moments to seek the face of God. And then when you hear my voice, I'll be closing us out in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for another beautiful day. And I thank you for the words of truth that we have heard thus far this day. Encouraging us to place our eyes, fix our eyes on the Lamb of God. To understand the power, the transforming power of your word. And that you desire to create in us, create in us clean hearts. You want to fill us with your spirit. You want to restore your image in us that we might ascend to the right hand of your throne. Lord, may we each realize the awesome privilege that you are extending to us through the everlasting gospel. And I am praying now for your Holy Spirit once again to open our eyes and to lead and direct us into all truth. Thank you for hearing this prayer, and in particular, before I close this prayer, I pray for myself that, Lord, you would cleanse my heart of all pride and self-trust and self-righteousness. Take my mind, use my mouth and my being for your honor and for your glory. I surrender myself into your hands. Thank you, Father, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles. We're going to the book of Revelation. I have a few things that I want to share with you from the book of Revelation before we get directly into our message. And there's a lot of information that I want to share with you within this message. And so I'm going to move at a very steady pace, but I'm asking you to stay with me. Amen? Once again, I'm going to move at a very steady pace, but I'm asking you to stay with me because there's a lot of information that I desire to share with you. And I want you to understand before we delve into the scriptures this morning that we may be looking at some things that you might not see how all of them interlock with one another, but I will assure you as we come to the conclusion of that which we are investigating this morning, we will see that God has a brilliant picture that he's trying to set before our faces. Are you with me? In the book of Revelation 8, Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9, we have the seven trumpets. What do we have in Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9? The seven trumpets. In Revelation chapter 9 in particular, we have three trumpets that are spoken of. And in the book of Revelation chapter 9, in the beginning of that chapter, we see a bottomless pit open up and we see a smoke proceed out of that bottomless pit. And it just stands on record as a prophetic symbol of the rise of the Islamic faith, the rise of Islam. Are you with me so far? Yes? If you're with me, say amen. Amen. In the book of Revelation chapter 11, we also see a bottomless pit opening up, but we do not see smoke proceeding forth out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11. Rather, we see a beast coming up out of this bottomless pit, and God identifies some of the characteristic traits of this beast, which we know, according to Daniel chapter 7, is a symbol of a civil power, a political entity. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation chapter 11, and I want you to look with me there. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11, please, because it tells us in verse 8 some of the identifying characteristics of this beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11. In verse 8 it says here, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and 
Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, we looked at Sodom last night, and we know that Sodom, according to the book of Jude, is characterized by its licentiousness, them going after fornication and strange flesh, which is dealing with homosexuality. So licentiousness, immorality, that is one of the primary characteristic traits of Sodom. Amen? Now, Egypt, what are some of the primary characteristic traits? Or one of the, what are one of the primary characteristic traits? Uh, what is the primary characteristic trait of Egypt? Go with me to the book of Exodus. We're looking at Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5, when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh to declare to him that God had called for him to let the children of Israel go, beginning at verse 2, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 5, and Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Pharaoh declared himself to be an atheist. Do you see that there? He said, I do not know the Lord. Hence, I will not obey the voice of this being whom I know not of. Pharaoh declared himself to be an atheist, and as Pharaoh was the head of Egypt, we see that Egypt in the Bible can characterize atheism. Are you with me so far? Yes? Sodom, licentiousness, Egypt, atheism. We see this being two of the primary characteristic traits of this beast that comes up out of this bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11. Now, I'm not going into all of the definites and particulars of Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 11. There's something that I want to point your attention to. Revelation chapter 9, smoke comes out of the bottomless pit, symbolic of Islam. Revelation chapter 11, beast comes out of the bottomless pit, and it is characterized as Sodom and Egypt, licentious, immoral, and atheistic. Secular humanism, we would say today. If you're following, say amen. Isn't it interesting how these very same things that came out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 11 are the scourge of the earth today? Is not Islam a scourge of the earth today? Is immorality plaguing the world today? Is secular humanism contaminating the minds of human beings today? It is replete throughout our scholastic, throughout academia. Are you following so far? And what I find interesting about this is that in between Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 11, we have what? Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 9, something's coming up. Revelation chapter 11, something's coming up. But in Revelation chapter 10, something is coming down. Are you following right now? Go with me to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, we're going to begin at the first verse. Revelation chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. And I'm sure that many of you have studied this chapter before, but please be engaged with me as we look at this because there's something that we are going to consider at this time that I believe many of us may have never taken the time to consider. In Revelation chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, having a rainbow upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet were as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left on the earth. This mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, rainbow upon his head, face like the sun, feet like pillars of fire, in his hand a little book open, right foot on the sea, left foot on the earth. Who is this mighty angel? And the people of God respond and say, this mighty angel is? Because I know that you're a good Seventh-day Adventist. But how do we know that this angel is Jesus Christ? Come on now, speak a little louder. I heard you talking earlier when you should have been talking, so act like you can talk. How do we know that this mighty angel is Jesus? He had a little bit open, rainbow upon his head. So basically, what you're getting ready to tell me over and over again is these different things that are spoken of in connection with this mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, identify that he is Jesus, right? That's what you're saying, am I right? Did I put the right words in your mouth? Yes, you are correct. Brothers and sisters, listen. The purpose of our study in Revelation chapter 10 this morning 
is not specifically to identify beyond the shadow of a doubt that this mighty angel, this mighty messenger, because we know an angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which means messenger, this mighty messenger, we're not simply trying to identify that it is Jesus, because I know that most of you here know that he is Jesus. What I want us to focus on is the mighty message that's being conveyed by the mighty messenger. Are you with me right now? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, please pay close attention with me as we go through the Bible. It says that we have this mighty angel coming down from heaven and he's clothed with a cloud. Now I stated earlier something that I know that you know, and that is that the word angel comes from the Greek word anglos, which means a messenger. This mighty messenger, the Bible says he is clothed with a cloud. Go with me to the book of Psalm chapter 104, Psalm the 104th division rather, and we're going to look at the third verse because we want to consider this issue of the cloud that is clothing this angel. Once again, I know that many of you may have studied this before, but please investigate the scriptures closely with me as if you've never studied this out before. Because there is a message that is going to come at the conclusion of this investigation that many of us may have never considered. The Bible says in Psalm 104 and verse 3, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariots, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. This is talking about God, and the Bible says that God makes the clouds his what? Chariots. Now, we're going to the book of Psalm, the 68th division now. Psalm, the 68th division, we know that God makes the clouds his chariots, but now what does the Bible say in Psalm 68 and verse 17 concerning the chariots of God? In Psalm 68 and verse 17, the Bible tells us here that chariots of God are even thousands of angels. The Lord is amongst them as in Sinai in the holy place. So God makes the clouds his chariots and the chariots of God are thousands, even 20,000s of angels. And the Lord is amongst them, even in the midst of them as he was on Mount Sinai. Are you following so far? Brothers and sisters, according to the scriptures, these clouds are a symbol of the angelic host. And we see that when the angels are moving as clouds, God himself is in the midst of them. When the Lord gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the mountain was covered with clouds and thundering, and God himself was in the midst. We're going to Psalm chapter 98 now. I want us to look at this one more time. Psalm the 98th division psalm the 98th division to be more exact and the bible tells us in psalm 98 looking at verse 2 the bible speaking of the throne of god did i say psalm 98 forgive me i meant psalm 97 psalm 97 and verse 2 looking at the words of god it tells us here clouds and darkness are round about him righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne so as god is sitting upon his throne what is surrounding him clouds and darkness so what does this say to us that as god sits upon his throne myriads of holy angels surround the presence of the glory of god are we all seeing this which lets us know that indeed this mighty messenger in revelation chapter 10 is no ordinary angel this mighty messenger must be divinity because only divinity is found within the midst of the clouds of heaven are you all with me right now first once again i want you to look at something with me go with me to the book of revelation revelation chapter 1 revelation chapter 1 look at another familiar verse of scripture to us here revelation chapter 1 Revelation chapter 1, and please forgive me if I'm moving at a very steady pace, but it's because I know that there's a lot of information and I want to respect the time that's been allotted unto me. Revelation chapter 1, and we're looking now at verse, verse 7. The Bible says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, Amen. Who is this speaking of right here? And this is speaking of the event of the second coming of Jesus Christ, is it not? He is coming and he will come with the clouds, or rather he will come with the angels of 
heaven. When we see Jesus Christ returning to planet earth for the second time in the scriptures, we always see that he does not come by himself, but he comes accompanied by the angelic host or the clouds of heaven. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24. We're going to look at this one more time. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matthew, the 24th chapter. And yes, we're going to begin at verse 29. Matthew 24 and verse 29. The Bible says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man where? In heaven. Keep on reading now. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with the pow with power and great glory verse 31 and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other so when jesus returns to planet earth for the second time he will not come by himself but he will come with the clouds of heaven is that true so this mighty messenger that we're looking at in the book of Revelation, chapter 10 and verse 1, I am suggesting to you that it is divinity, and in particular, it is the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. Furthermore, as we see in the Bible that when Jesus Christ returns, or the second advent of Jesus Christ will be an event in which the clouds of heaven will accompany him, the angels will go forth and they will gather together the elect of heaven. Is that true? Or the elect of earth, I should rather say. Amen? Amen. I want to speak about this one more time from the scriptures. Go with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to look at the 16th verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, looking at the 16th verse. We're looking at the issue of the second advent in which Jesus is accompanied by the clouds of heaven and the angels will go forth to gather the elect, but the Bible gives us some more particulars concerning this event. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the what? Ah, oh, archangel. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now before I even deal with the dead in Christ rising first, I want to deal with the fact that when the Lord himself descends from heaven, he will come with a shout and he will give forth the voice of whom? The archangel, does not Jesus himself tell us in the book of Matthew chapter 12, I believe it's verse 32. And he was speaking to the Pharisees. He said, O ye generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What comes out of the mouth of the Lord when he descends from heaven? The voice of the archangel. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He gives forth the voice of the archangel because he is the archangel. If you understand, say amen. Well, so brothers and sisters, we are just seeing from the scriptures that Jesus Christ indeed is the mighty messenger. He is the archangel. And the title archangel does not mean that the one who possesses it must be a literal angel. The title archangel simply means that the one that possesses this title is above an authority over all the angelic host. He is above. Arch means above and over. Are you with me so far? Now, notice that when he comes, the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first at the second advent. Amen? I want to say something to you, and it is true. It is impossible for anyone to objectively, what word did I just use? There is, it is impossible for anyone to objectively study the issue of the second coming and not come to a clear understanding of the state of the dead. I'll say it one more time. It is impossible for anyone to study the issue of the second coming and not come to a clear understanding of the state of the dead. Because we are told that when the Lord himself comes, the dead in Christ will rise first. If the dead go to heaven before the second advent, so let's work this out. So when you die, you have a spirit that goes to heaven, you hang out with Jesus for a few years, then when Jesus comes back, he sends your your, your holy sanctified spirit back down to corrupt planet earth to inhabit a corrupt body so that he can, in a moment, give you an incorrupt eye. Ah, that makes a lot of sense to me now. 
nonsense. You understand the point? Are you getting right now? It is impossible to objectively study the issue of the second advent and not come to a clear understanding of the state of the dead. And as we study out the issue of this mighty messenger being clothed with a cloud, we can't study it out without introducing the issue of the second advent. Are you with me right now? Brothers and sisters, so what we are seeing from the scripture is that Jesus is indeed this mighty angel or mighty messenger, even the archangel that is spoken of in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1. Now, I don't know everyone that's in here right now. There may be some visitors. Please excuse me if there are none here, but I always like to make sure that I speak for everyone. And so there may be someone that is here. That's still in your mind is saying, hold on a second. So are you trying to tell me that Jesus, Jesus is God. I've just declared Jesus to be God. Did you not hear that? I said he's divine. So you're saying that Jesus is an angel? Yes, I'm saying that Jesus is a messenger. Even the archangel, the arch messenger. Are you following right now? Even Michael, the archangel. Are you with me right now? Matter of fact, go with me to the book of Jude. Jude. And this is important because I've stood in front of congregations and I've dealt with this issue before and I was told that there was none but Seventh-day Adventists in there and at the end of the message there were many that told me I never knew truly that Jesus was Michael. Bible says in the book of Jude, the book of Jude looking at verse 9 and somebody else studied this out. I believe it was Brother Gabe. Was it not Brother Gabe? Brother, it was Brother Gabe the other day. We're looking at Jude in verse 9. Reinforce what was studied the other morning. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. So we see this contention, we see this contention between Michael and the devil. And we know that the title Michael means who is like the most high, who is like the most high. You know, it's more of, it's more of a question and a declaration then it is a statement. Do you hear what I'm just saying? In other words, who is like the Most High? Let me lay this out on the line for you. Remember, there was a contest in heaven. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14 that the devil said, I will ascend above the heights of the... In other words, he's saying, I am going to be greater than being an angel anymore. You see the point now? I am going to ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'm not going to be another ordinary angel. I will be like the Most High. Does the Bible ever say that the devil went into direct hand-to-hand -hand conflict with God the Father? No. In Revelation chapter 12, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Why is that? Because we know that I have just suggested to you, and I've given you, more than enough evidence, I believe, thus far to prove that Jesus is Michael, but we'll prove it a little bit more as we go forward. But nonetheless, why is it that if the devil wanted to be like the Most High, that the Father himself didn't enter into this hand-to-hand -hand conflict, so to say, with the devil? Why was it Michael? Remember, what does the name Michael mean? Who is like the Most High. In other words, the Father says, oh, you want to be like me? Then let's see that you can be like me. Go through Michael. <laughs> Do you get the point? You want to be like the Most High? The only one whom is like the Most High is the one whose name is who is like the Most High. You don't get the point. Michael's name is a contest. Who else is like the Most High? None but the Son is like the Most High. Are you getting the point here? And so the devil and his angels fought with Michael. The Bible goes on to say, brothers and sisters, I want to establish from the scriptures that Jesus Christ truly is a messenger, but he's only a messenger for one. Go with me to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. And I don't mean to exhaust you on this particular point, but I believe that it is important because we are talking about Jesus. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to give unto his servant John. 
So look at the progression of the revelation. The revelation originated with God the Father. God the Father then conveyed the revelation to Jesus, his son. Jesus, his son, then conveyed the revelation to his angel. The angel gave the revelation to John, and the prophet gives the revelation to us. So in this course of events, Jesus is acting as a messenger for only one, and that one is God the Father. Do you see that? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Once again, we're looking at this topic. Hebrews chapter 1. Because I want to establish this from the Bible as much as possible in the short space of time that I have, that Jesus is this mighty messenger in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1. Look at verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 1. The Bible says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. If God is communicating messages to us through his Son, does that not mean that Jesus the Son is acting as a messenger for the Father? Amen. Even the Bible declares this one last time. We're going to the book of Malachi. The last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says here, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. This is speaking of John the Baptist, but now look closer. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Notice the Lord whom we seek is called the messenger of the covenant. Are you following? The Lord whom we seek, the Bible says, that will come suddenly into his temple. He is even the messenger of the covenant. And this is why the mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10 not only is clothed with a cloud, but he has a rainbow upon his head. What does a rainbow stand as a symbol of in the scriptures? The covenant, brothers and sisters. Go with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis, the ninth chapter. Genesis, the ninth chapter. In Genesis chapter 9, and we're going to look now at verse 12. This is what God says. Matter of fact, let's look at verse 16. I like this one. It's a nice scripture song. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 16. The Bible says, And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. So God set the rainbow in the cloud that we see after the rain as an everlasting covenant that God has made between him, man, and every living creature. And we know it's that he will never destroy this world once again with a flood. That is the everlasting covenant that is, tip of, that is um, symbolized by the rainbow in the cloud. Are you following so far? But there is another rainbow that is spoken of in the scriptures other than the one that we see appear in the sky after the rain falls to the ground. Go with me to the book of Revelation once again and we're going to chapter 4. Am I going too fast? I have to keep at the speed nonetheless. <laughs> Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, and we're going to begin at verse 3. Revelation chapter 4, looking at verse 3. The Bible says, speaking of the throne of God, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So there is a rainbow that also encircles the throne of God that is now located in the courts of heaven in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, why am I bringing this to your attention? Because the rainbow that appears in the cloud after the rain and the rainbow that encircles the throne on high are tokens of two different covenants. Did you know that? In the book 
Education, page 115. Once again, you can look this up for yourself. The book, Education, page 115, it tells us there, the rainbow that spans the heavens with its arch of light is a token of the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature, Genesis 9 and verse 16. And the rainbow that encircles the throne on high is also a token, uh, also a token rather, to God's children of the covenant of peace. So the rainbow that encircles the throne on high is a token of the covenant of peace. Brothers and sisters, what is the covenant of peace? Does anyone know? Okay. Ah, good. So we're going to the book of, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Because in Ezekiel chapter 37, it just speaks in very plain language concerning this covenant of peace. And one rightly said, it is the gospel. But Ezekiel chapter 37, and let's look at verse 26. Look what the Bible says. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant, and I will place them, and I will multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the covenant of peace is that God is once again going to adopt us as his children and he will acknowledge himself as our God. There will not, there will not be anything between us and God to separate us once again. Are you following so far? Matter of fact, the Bible says that he will set his sanctuary in the midst of them. But then he goes on to say, my tabernacle also shall be with them. So not only will he place this physical structure in the midst of his people, but he says his tabernacle, meaning his own physical dwelling, will continue with these people that he's making this covenant with. Now, how is God going to accomplish this covenant of peace? That he will be our God. And we shall be his people. What is it that God must do to solidify this covenant? You know the answer. Okay, go with me to the book of Hebrews. I already know you know the answer. The book of Hebrews. We're going to Hebrews chapter 8. Where are we going now? Hebrews chapter 8. Beginning at verse 10. I know you know the scripture. In Hebrews 8, beginning at verse 10, the Bible says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And when he does this, what will take place? And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. When God can place his law in our minds, write them in our hearts, then he says, Now I'm your God, and you are my people. Why is it not sufficient for God to place the law in our minds and not in our hearts? Or why is it not? Are you following right now? Why did he say our minds and in our hearts? Because our minds, brothers and sisters, and our hearts here in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 are symbolizing two different things. The mind, he's saying, I want my law to be in their minds. I want them to be intellectually settled into my truth. But I want my law to be in their hearts. I want them to have an experience with me. I want them to have a desire for me. I want them to love to keep my commandments. Because they love me. And when they have this experience, then I can say, I am their God and they are my people. Brothers and sisters, this is the ceiling work. And notice he said he'll make this covenant with whom? The house of Israel. And guess whom are the people that are sealed in Revelation chapter 7? The children of Israel. Just look at verse 4 in Revelation chapter 7 when time is available for you to do so. When God can place his law in our hearts and in our minds so that we can be his people and he can be our God, he's also going to do something else. I want you to look with me in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to begin at verse 16. Hebrews chapter 10, looking at the 16th verse. 
the Bible says, once again, we're looking at the very same covenant of peace. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Now look at verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Because there has to be peace. And what makes enmity between God and man? Sin. Brothers and sisters, how is God going to forget your sins and iniquities? I mean, I want you to think about this. I think it's a valid question because God knows all things. He knew all things before there was anything. So how does one that knows all things forget anything? Is it not a valid question? How does one that knows all things forget anything? Go with me to Isaiah chapter 43. I want you to look at this with me. Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. I know sometimes we're saying, well, why would you even ask that question? It's a valid question, brothers and sisters. We're talking about someone that never forgets is saying, I'm going to forget. <laughs> Something's got to happen for him to forget. Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, I love this verse of scripture. It speaks of the love of God. It says here, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for your own sake. Does the Bible say that? No. It says, for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. The way that God will not remember our sins and iniquities is by blotting them out. Brothers and sisters, where does the blotting out of sins take place? Investigative judgment. And where in particular does this work transpire? In the most holy place of the sanctuary. The work, the work of blotting out, the, the work of the blotting out of sins takes place in the sanctuary, in particular in the most holy place. And God says that he is going to blot out our sins for his own sake. God literally has a vested interest in getting rid of your sins. He doesn't want to remember them. And it makes a lot of sense to me, especially, brother, especially for those of us here that are married. It makes a lot of sense because God is trying to foment this type of marriage union between himself and the church. Am I telling the truth right now? That is the mystery of godliness. It is even spoken of in the book of Ephesians. Quickly, I wasn't planning on going here, but let's go there nonetheless. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible says here in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning at verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So in this union between man and women, when the two become one flesh, God is just trying to symbolize in kindergarten lessons to us something that is beyond human comprehension, how divinity and humanity can be merged together as one. He says this is a great mystery, but he is speaking concerning the issue of the gospel and the union of Christ and his church. It's a powerful thing, brothers and sisters. God says, I need to blot out your sins so that I can't remember them. It makes a lot of sense for those of us who are married. Why? Think about this. If your spouse did a horrible wrong unto you, they faulted you in such a fashion, it was pretty bad. And you tried to work out this issue. And then you came to a point and you said, okay, I forgive you. But you never really forgave. And that thing was always right here. Would love exist in the home? No. Why? Because that thing would always... God wants to love us with nothing in between so he will use his own omnipotent power on himself to forget. Brothers and sisters, that's powerful to me. That God would exercise his own omnipotent power on his mind so that he can forget. 
your sin because he doesn't want to remember it, because he wants to love you with nothing between. And so when we look at this issue, brothers and sisters, of the rainbow that is above the head of this mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10, we cannot help but consider the issue, issue of the covenant of peace, but the covenant of peace is established by God taking his law, his commandments, and placing them in the hearts of men. And when God can place his commandments in the hearts of men and know that they are secure there like the ark of the covenant, then he will blot out our sins in the sanctuary. Because that is where the throne is located, in the sanctuary. And the Bible tells us that this mighty angel, he not only has a rainbow upon his head, but his face shines like the sun. Go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. The Bible tells us in Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and the what? morning star so jesus is this spiritual son that is spoken of in the scriptures let us look at this one more time in the bible go with me to revelation chapter 1 looking at verse 16 and just like you said at the very onset of our investigation it is so clear up until now that this mighty messenger can be none other than jesus christ himself revelation 1 and verse 16 now the scripture giving a description of jesus christ as he was on the isle of patmos with john the revelator the Bible says he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, meaning his face, his visage, was like the sun shining in its strength. The one whose face shines like a sun is none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, whom is our righteousness, is he not? Matter of fact, the Bible clearly states that in 1 Corinthians. Please turn there quickly with me. We don't have to go there, but I, need, I think we need to go there. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 30. Speaking of this very same Jesus Christ, who face, whose, whose face shines like the sun, the Bible tells us, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So Jesus has been made to be our righteousness. Go with me to Malachi chapter 4 now. The reason I went to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30 is so that as we look at Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, we know exactly who the scripture is speaking of without a shadow of a doubt in our mind. Malachi 4 and verse 2. The Bible says here, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness. Who's the one that's, whose face shines like the sun? Jesus. Who is our righteousness? Jesus. So he must be the Son of righteousness. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. Question. Does the Son of Righteousness arise unto everyone? No. According to the Scripture, the answer is no. The Son of Righteousness only arises unto those that fear His name. He said, unto those that fear My name shall the Son of Righteousness arise. So the prerequisite for experiencing the healing rays of the Son of Righteousness is to fear His name. Brothers and sisters, what is the name of God? Talk to me. We looked at it from the scripture the other day, so we've been studying together. We don't need to go through everything. What do we? It's his character. We saw this in the book of Exodus chapter 34, beginning at verse 5, when God was communing with Moses. God came down, descended in a cloud, and he proclaimed to Moses that he was the Lord, Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. To fear the name of God is to reverence and respect the character of God. You know, the majority of Christendom loves to respect and reverence the fact that God is a God of love, of mercy, that he's abundant in goodness and truth. Most of the times when you, be, when you go to any church, I don't care what they claim themselves to be, Catholic, Pentecostal, Mormon, whatever. 
You go into those churches, many of them, majority, and you talk about the mercy of God and his grace, everyone is happy. As soon as you come down to the fact that he will by no means clear the guilty, everyone is quiet. Because we love to talk about the grace of God, but we don't like to talk about the justice of God. But we love the justice of God. Because anytime someone can... Anytime someone does something unjust unto you, you immediately want justice. But when you do something unjust to God, you continually, perpetually want mercy. You want justice, just not for us. Yeah? Brothers and sisters, but God is looking for a people that will fear his name. And we saw from the scriptures, that the name of God, when he was delineating the various attributes of his character, he declared himself to be a God of truth. We also saw that in Psalm 119 and verse 142 that the law is truth. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that the law of God is a transcript of the character of God. Therefore, to fear the name of God, if you truly reverence and respect God, then by faith you will keep his commandments. Which means to keep his commandments, you will seek to flee from your sin. Because when the commandments are set before your face, you see your sin. That's why Paul said, should I say that the commandments are what? Should I say that the law is? Okay, brothers and sisters, go with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Let's make sure. I want these things in our mind. Romans the 7th chapter. Romans, the seventh chapter. Remember the words of Paul. He makes this statement in verse 7 concerning the law of God. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Yea, I had not known sin, but by what? For I had not known lust, except what? The law said, thou shalt not covet. Paul didn't know that he was in sin until... Paul had what presented to him? The law. And the law convicted him of his sin. And as the law convicted him of his sin, Paul began to loathe himself and his righteousness turned into unrighteousness. And he cried, O wretched man that I am, whom shall deliver me from this body of? He wanted to be delivered from this agency that he knew was killing him. Because Paul knew that the wages of sin is death. Brothers and sisters, to fear the name of God is not simply to say, oh, I know that God is a good God. I know he's there. I believe in God. But it is to reverence and respect God, to loathe sin in your life, and to desire to be set free from anything that offends God. But realizing that you don't have the power to deliver yourself. But the Bible says unto them that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. In other words, God is looking for a people that realize they need healing before he provides healing. Didn't Jesus say that to the Pharisees? I came not for those that are whole, but for... The are you seeing the point right now? Brothers and sisters, God is looking for a people that want to be delivered from their sin. And he says, if you want deliverance, if you want it with all of your heart, the son of righteousness will come, he will arise, and he will bring healing. The Bible said there will be healing in his wings. And I've shared this with some of you before, I'm pretty sure. But when you look at that word wings, it doesn't simply mean the wings on the back of a bird or the wings on the back of an angel. But that word wings in the original language, it means the borders of one's garments. And we're talking about the son of righteousness, which means we're talking about Jesus Christ. When Jesus, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, what nation was he a part of? Good, right? Because in the book of Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which is made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. So Jesus was an Israelite according to the flesh. Amen? 
What did Israelites have at the borders of their garments, brothers and sisters? God himself commissioned them to have something at the borders of their garments. It was a ribbon of blue. And what was it there as a symbol of? Go with me to Numbers chapter 15. Good. Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. Let's go to verse 38. Numbers chapter 15, going to verse 38. Please forgive me if I'm moving with rapidity. I have to turn on my New York because the time is going on me. Numbers 15, beginning at verse 38. Are you with me right now? It says, speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the border a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that ye go not after your own hearts and after your own eyes after which ye used to go a what? A whoring. Brothers and sisters, God wants to heal a people from, them, from their whoredom issue. We have a whoredom issue. You realize that, right? <sighs> James chapter 4 and verse 4, he said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's our problem. We want to be children of God, but we want to have fellowship with the world. And that was Paul's problem. Paul said, the things that I would do, I do not. And that which I would not do, that I? He had a whoredom problem. He was unfaithful and he wanted healing. There's healing in the borders of Christ's garment. Just like the woman, you remember the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years. And you do realize that in the Bible, a woman can stand as a symbol of the church. This woman, brothers and sisters, remember, we learned in the scriptures from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11 that many of these literal accounts stand on record as types and symbols. And this woman clearly stands as a symbol of God's church. Why? Twelve. Twelve apostles, twelve tribes of Israel, twelve gates into the city, twelve foundations to the city. Twelve is the number of God's government structure in the Bible. Is not God's church the government on earth? And like this woman, don't we have blood running out of us? Because Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the... We're talking about a people that are dying. Don't you see the church dying left and right? You see the presentations that my brother shared with us concerning spiritualism infesting every quarter of our church right now, and he didn't even share the half with us as of yet. This is a dead church. And you might ask, why are they going in this direction and that direction? The same, the same reason that that woman was spending her money every place to find healing. And we're thinking, if we get T.D. Jakes and we get Rick Warren and we get all these men and their spiritual formations, this is going to bring some type of revival into the church. It's going to bring life back into the church. But what's happening? We're just dying even the more. But what happened with this woman? Ultimately, when she came to the end of her line, she heard about Jesus, that he was a healer, and she, by faith, reached out and touched the borders of her garment. And Jesus said, someone touched me. They said, of course someone touched you. We all touched you. He said, her touch was different. Why? Because virtue went out of me. Brothers and sisters, listen, there were a multitude of people that were around Jesus that day and all of them wanted to be near Jesus for one reason or another. Some were there for the fishes and the loaves. Some were there because they wanted to be connected to the person they thought was the Messiah, they thought was going to be the champion of Israel. They all wanted to have some type of association with Jesus. But the difference between her and the rest of the people is that they wanted to be with Jesus. She knew that she needed Jesus or she would perish. And that is the touch of faith that brings healing. How many times when you get down on your knees, you pray and say you want Jesus, but do you realize that you need Jesus this morning or you will perish? That's why many times we get down on our knees and we pray, but there is no virtue. So we pray, but we get off of our knees and our lives go on just as powerless as they were the day before. Because when we get down, we don't realize, Lord, if I don't receive grace this morning right now, I'm surely going to perish in my sins. This woman knew the same way that we must know. We must touch Jesus. We must connect ourselves by faith with Jesus or we will perish. 
And when she received healing, Jesus looked upon her and said, Woman, be of good cheer. Thy faith hath made thee whole. She was not, she didn't just receive physical healing, brothers and sisters. She was made whole. Spiritually, physically, God wants to make us whole. She left justified, but she left healed as well. Did you hear what I just said? Do you think that's what God desires for us, spiritual as well as physical healing? You know this very well. Third John in verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy so as we're increasing spiritually, God wants us also to increase physically. That's his desire for us. Which brings me to the next point. Justification by faith, which is what that woman experienced when she touched the borders of Christ's garment. And the health message, they're inseparable. Brothers and sisters, did you hear that? I'll say it again. Justification by faith, which is another term for righteousness by faith. And the health message, they are inseparable. The book Evangelism, page 190, Sister Wright said, Many have written unto me, inquiring, is the message of justification by faith the third angel's message? She said, I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. It is the very fundamental truth of the third angel's message. It is what the third angel's message is. Me message is. It is the very fabric of the everlasting gospel. That's it. Justification by faith. But then we're told in Testimonies to the Church, volume 1, page 486, I believe it's paragraph 2. She said, I was shown, you know this one, I was shown that the health reform is a part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with it as the arm and the hand or the hand and the arm with the human body. God's people must make advance moves in this work. Ministers and people must act in concert. Listen to the next statement. God's people are not yet prepared for the loud cry of the third angel. She said we're not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel because we have not made the advances in the health reform that we should have. If we're not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel, God is saying we are not prepared to receive the latter rain because we have not embraced the health reform as we, have sh as we should have already. Righteousness by faith, justification by faith, and the health message are inseparable. The son of righteousness wants to heal us. Because we are told by the servant of the Lord that to break the health laws is just as criminal an act as to break the moral law. Because our bodies are the temple of the living God. Face shining like the sun as we come to a close. I just need 10 minutes. As we come to a close, the Bible tells us that the feet of the mighty angel were like pillars of fire. When you think of pillars of fire, there should be one place in particular your mind goes to in the Bible. Where is that I'm thinking of right now? Exodus, that's correct. Let's go to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, and let's look at verse 21. Exodus chapter 13, looking at verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day. We're speaking about the children of Israel making their exodus out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. So God, when he was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt at nighttime, he led them in the darkness by a pillar of fire. Am I right? And he would lead them by a pillar of fire until the daytime when he would lead them by a pillar of cloud, right? So the pillar of fire was leading them out of the darkness into the light or out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Are you following so far? Brothers and sisters, what did Egypt stand? What does Egypt stand as a symbol of in the Bible other than atheism? Darkness. Okay, let's look at one more thing. Go with me to Hebrews. You know this one as well. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, looking at verse 24, 
The Bible tells us by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What could Egypt stand as a symbol of? Sin. So when God was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt by a pillar of fire, he was literally leading them out of the land of sin or he was giving them victory over sin. When God led the children of Israel through the Red Sea, was it by a pillar of cloud or by a pillar of fire? Pillar of fire. Do you know what the Red Sea crossing stands as a symbol of in the Bible? You do know this one. Baptism. Go with me. Let's prove it quickly from the scriptures. For those who are not familiar with it, we're going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Once again, I apologize for moving so rapidly, but we need all these things and the time is limited. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're beginning at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So when they went through the Red Sea crossing, it was a symbol of sin. And we learned this morning, as our dear brother was sharing with us from the scripture, that Baptism in the book of Romans chapter 6 verses 2 and 3 is a symbol of the destruction of the old man but to rise up in the newness of life in Jesus Christ which is simply to gain victory over sin through Christ. When God led his people by a pillar of fire he was leading them to have victory over sin. Pillar of fire. What are you talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? No, 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 no. Under the cloud and through the sea. The Red Sea crossing was a symbol of? Yes. Oh, you're saying it was the fire. That's right. But they were all, no, no, no. It's not talking about the Red Sea crossing in particular there. It's saying that they were all under the cloud and all went through the sea. Okay, amen? Everybody understand the point? Did they not all walk under the cloud during the daytime? Yes, and they all went through the sea during the nighttime. Amen. The Bible tells us, brothers and sisters, that the pillar of fire is dealing with this issue of God giving his people victory over sin. And the word of God went on to say that this angel in Revelation chapter 10, looking at verse 2, he had in his hand a little book open. Now, I'm not going to attempt to break all down, break down all of the particulars of what that little book's contents were. But we can see very quickly from Revelation chapter 10 what was in that little book. And I want you to go with me to the very last verse 10, verse 10 of Revelation chapter 10 to find out something about this little book in that angel's hand the mighty messenger, Jesus Christ himself. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it up, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The contents of that book was prophecy. Amen? And Prophecy comes only through one agency, and that is the spirit of prophecy. Are you following? That book contained the spirit of prophecy. Why am I talking about these things? You may not have been paying attention, brothers and sisters, but we learned something very important this morning. Mighty angel came down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. The cloud is directly connected to the issue that the one who's in the midst of the cloud is divinity. But we saw that as we looked at the issue of the cloud surrounding divinity, we looked at the issue of the second advent, and we also came to the understanding that you can't look at the second advent and not come to an accurate understanding of the state of the dead. We saw that this angel also had a rainbow upon his head. The rainbow is connected to the covenant. The covenant exalts the law of God, but the law of God is established in the hearts of men in the work that goes forward in the sanctuary. Are you following? 
And the Bible tells us that the face of this angel was like the sun. And we saw that this is connected to the message of justification by faith as well as the health message. We saw the feet as pillars of fire, and we saw the feet as pillars of fire directly connected to the issue of gaining victory over sin. And the little book open is connected to the spirit of prophecy. Brothers and sisters, these are the seven pillars of our faith. State of the dead. Are you following right now? State of the dead. The law of God. The sanctuary message, justification by faith, the health message, victory over sin, the spirit of prophecy. Those are the seven pillars of our faith as Seventh-day Adventists. These things were not developed by men. They were communicated unto us by Jesus Christ himself. They are the foundations of our faith. And God is going to have a people that are going to take this mighty message that has been communicated by the mighty messenger and they will go forth in the world in these last days to give a mighty cry. Because the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 18, as we close now, Revelation chapter 18, Revelation chapter 18 beginning at verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a what? Strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. We see another angel coming down in Revelation chapter 18. And this angel, brothers and sisters, he gives a mighty cry. Why? Because he received the mighty message. He gives a mighty cry because the mighty messengers that are being spoken of here, they have become one with the mighty messenger of Revelation chapter 10. Christ in them, the hope of glory. They built upon the seven pillars of our faith. Brothers and sisters, we must in this critical hour build upon the blueprint of our faith, the seven pillars. If our, if our Christian walk, if the building of this house that we're seeking to settle, settle upon the rock that we talked about on Sabbath, if the building structure is not supported by these seven, pil seven pillars, brothers and sisters, all of our building is in vain. The Bible says it in Psalm 127 and verse 1, except the Lord build the house, then they that labor, labor in vain. And many of us, what are we doing? We're laboring in vain. Because we say, yes, I believe in the message of righteousness by faith. I believe in it. I believe in righteousness by faith. But when it comes to the health message, I haven't gotten there yet. Oh, I believe in the message of the state of the dead. But you can't really get victory over sin. And so people are building with five, four, two, and maybe six pillars, but God gave seven. And you cannot question the integrity of God's blueprint. If you question the integrity of one of those pillars, then all of your labors are in vain. We need all seven. My question to you this morning is, is the Lord building your house or are you laboring in vain? Because if we are going to stand in the crisis that was spoken of earlier, if we are going to be set up on the rock Christ Jesus, there's only one blueprint, and Jesus himself gave it. And so this is my appeal to you because my time is up. Brothers and sisters, if it is your desire this morning to say, Lord, I don't want to labor in vain. I don't want to question the integrity of any of your pillars. Neither do I want to pay more attention to one than the other. I want to make sure that all of them are firmly set up in their place that you have appointed for them. If that is your desire this morning, to build, not by your own might, but to allow the Lord to build your house. I just invite you to stand to your feet with me as we close in prayer.
Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for giving us grace and giving us minds and sending your spirit to teach us and to help us deal with a great deal of important Bible truth in the space of time that we've been together. But even more importantly, I want to thank you that we can have a firm Bible-based conviction that this great Advent movement and the doctrines contained therein, that they were not developed by the ingenuity of finite man, but they were delivered by the very Son of God himself. And you have called us to be a people, not constructing our own blueprint for our existence, but you have called us to build according to your design, in your will, according to your way. And so we pray, as we know that we are weak and we have no strength within us, to even lift up one of these pillars, Lord, and make sure that they are steadfast and immovable. Father, please give us more of your spirit and help us as we're struggling at times when the flesh wars against one pillar or the other, like Jesus, help us to say, not our will, but thy will be done. Thank you for hearing this prayer and bless us, Lord, as we continue on these campgrounds together. And even when we leave this place, may we walk in the light. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.